All right, folks, uh, good afternoon, good evening, good morning. Let's go ahead and get started uh, with our special uh, one o'clock brief this afternoon. Uh, I have a very special guest from Traders uh, Accounting, Jerry Allison. You guys know what I got to do in about an hour, hour and 15 minutes. I got to jump in the car and go down to the FLA Live Arena so I can watch my boy Jack play uh, on the big ice. Boca Bobcats versus the Spanish River, whatever they are. Big rivalry gain on the Florida Panthers ice. So uh, definitely around an hour, hour and 15. I got to be out of here. It just depends on how long uh, uh, Jerry goes and your questions. So love having uh, the folks from Traders Accounting uh, as a good strategic partner, uh, especially this time of the year, uh, December, before my birthday on December 31st. Uh, shameless plug. Uh, to get all your tax questions uh, answered, right? Especially with the... Uh, Capital gains changes that happened this year. Uh, let's go, Brandon, and all that good stuff. So we have uh, Jerry Allison, 500-pound head, folks, a doctorate in uh, business administration and an, a master's in mathematics. So obviously makes my political science look uh, a little low. 30-plus years in accounting and taxation, helping clients start and maintain their businesses in a bunch of uh, of different industries, which is really cool. 25 years of teaching experience yeah. as well. So he's going to be able to do a, a great job uh, teaching us. Married, father of three uh, wonderful children from nine to 16 years old, obviously keeping him young. So uh, Jerry, uh, without right. uh, without further ado, my friend, I will uh, give you the controls and, uh, and get out of your way. So let me uh, throw it on over uh, to you and you can get us airborne. Sounds fantastic. Thank you. And we got to get out for that hockey game. Definitely. So absolutely. Uh, that's that's going to be that sounds exciting. I'd like to go to a good hockey game. So anyway, let's get on to uh, what we're doing today. Um, the, the session we're talking about is trader tax status versus investor status, and what it means to you. Uh, some of you may have seen this before, but there's new information. Matter of fact, there's some uh, new stuff that we're going to embed in here. Uh, hey, Jerry, later can on. You I'm sorry, real quick. Can you make sure your slides are up? Uh, I gave you a control and not. Oh, seeing. okay. Yeah, just click share your screen. There you go. We're good. All right. There we go. Okay. So we are going to go through this today. And there's some new information here uh, that I feel is very excited. We uh, had to do, we sat down and did some calculations about some uh, investors tremendously uh, that uh, we didn't realize before and that uh, you, you probably don't realize. And then so also some uh, reasons for setting up uh, LLCs, things like that. So let's go ahead and get into it as we go along. First thing is we do want to go through a disclaimer here, make the attorneys happy. And so the best of our knowledge, the information given in this webinar is accurate. And that's why we constantly update this thing. We constantly look at it to make sure that things are uh, up to date. But, um, you know, who knows what's going to happen? Uh, Congress still has some time during the end of this year. I was just watching uh, another webinar myself uh, a little while ago, and they're predicting possibly a couple things that could happen, but probably not by the end of the year. So since tax changes do change uh, constantly uh, on the state level, the local, federal level, things like that, uh, you might want to check with your tax professional before using this information. Uh, just so you know, they don't all have to run through Congress either. The tax commissioner does have a few uh, discretionary items that can change. So uh, I would suggest keeping up on this and making sure it's still accurate when you decide to use it. Uh, the seminar does not establish a professional or confidential relationship between you, myself, or Traders Accounting, and Traders Accounting is not a law firm, so what's given here should not be construed as legal advice. So what we're gonna do today is we're going to look, go through this presentation. Uh, I'm gonna go through what trader tax status is. We're gonna look at entities. Uh, we will look at the mark-to-market -mark election. And then also we will, at the end, we will have some time for uh, question and answer. So just kind of be looking forward uh, for that. Now, before we get into it, a little bit about a trader account, trader's accounting information, our website. We have a special link up there. It's tradersaccounting.com slash TGO. And that will send you to a place where you can download a free ebook that contains a lot of the information I'm going to talk about today. Um, not all of it because there's some new stuff, as I mentioned, but this uh, free ebook is, is extremely vital and it give you some good information. 
Our phone number is 800-938-9513. And of course, our email is learn at tradersaccounting.com. So what we want to do is we want to look at uh, business first, because as a trader, you need to think in terms of a business. Um, it's not just enough to go through uh, trading in your life, just haphazardly doing things. Matter of fact, what you're doing right now is going through these classes and these seminars and things like that to make sure that you understand. And that's what businesses do. And so we want to make sure that uh, you treat this like a business. Now, why is treating it like a business? Well, it's very important because you understand what's critical for a business. The most thing, the most important thing for any business is not customers, it's not um, a product, it's not anything like that. The most important thing for any business and for you guys especially is cash flow. You've got to keep cash coming into uh, your business, your trading business. Well, we spend a lot of time talking about uh, trading strategies, how to get money into uh, your trading business. But there's a, a second side to this is we want to make sure that uh, we, we not let cash go out of the business that's unnecessary. And so regardless of the business, it doesn't matter what type of business it is, if cash isn't coming in or you're not keeping cash in, the business is going to starve to death. And so it's very important to talk about both sides of this equation. You've got to get cash in and you've got to keep cash from going out of your business. So having said that, the points in this webinar are designed to either generate cash flow or protect your cash flow to keep it from leaving to save you some money. Now, the first strategy that we're going to look at, which you may have already heard of, is trader tax status. Now, trader tax status gets very much confused with mark to market the election. Um, and the reason they, they are coupled together slightly, but they are different. Trader tax status allows a trader to deduct trading expenses from their tax return, just like a business. And this is why you have to think of a business. So the idea here is being able to put these expenses onto your tax return and being able to get, if you will, a refund from the state and the IRS to offset some of those expenses, depending on what your tax bracket is. Why is this important? Well, let's look at an example here. Suppose a trader with trader tax status deducts a $5,000 training course. And by the way, training courses, they're easily $5,000 or close to it. And so that is a major deduction if you go and put that into your, uh, as your deduction on your tax return. So if this trader's in the 32% tax bracket, that trader just increased cash flow by $1,600 over a trader without TTS. <clears throat> so what have you done? Well, first of all, you've taken a $5,000 training course and you've reduced it to $3,400 basically because the IRS is subsidizing part of this. And by the way, we're just using federal tax brackets. Uh, some of you live in states where you don't have an income tax. Some of you live in states where you do. So this changes a little bit, but let's just look at federal. Uh, so you've reduced the amount of your uh, $5,000 course by $1,600. That's money coming back into the business that you can invest now. And, and as you guys know, it is very important to take the money you have and reinvest it. It is very important to take any money you save and keep it going so you can build that portfolio. Now, there's a trap that people fall into with this principle. We wanna be able to deduct expenses on our, our tax return. We wanna be able to get money back from the IRS and from the state, uh, if you have a state income tax, to subsidize basically your trading activity. But there's a trap that people fall into. And it's this, it's unwise to spend money just to get a tax deduction. It always results in decreasing cash flow um, because it's a psychological thing, actually. Uh, you guys that are, you trade, you understand the psychology behind trading. Well, 
taxes are no different. There's a psychology here, and just going out and spending money to get a tax deduction is does not make any sense. Let me give you an example. I was working with a, a, a guy who owned an auto repair shop here several uh, years ago, and uh, he wanted to go out. We were talking in December, just right now. We were talking in December, and he wanted to go out and buy this twenty thousand dollar tire machine. And I thought, okay, well, why do you want to do this? Well, I want the tax deduction. So I said, okay, well, I'll calculate it up. He said, you probably get about $6,000 back in taxes. And I said, how often were you going to use this tire machine? Oh, maybe once or twice a year. <clears throat> so he's telling me that it's going to take probably 20, 25 years to pay for this thing in order to get $6,000 back from the IRS. It's not worth it. You don't go out and spend money just to get a tax deduction. It's the wrong focus. The only reason you spend money in a business is it helps you generate more income. So when you spend money in a, in a trading business, that money that you spend should, be, should enable you to pay for itself. In other words, should enable you to, to generate income. For example, your internet connection. Uh, that's money spent, but it allows you to actually connect to your brokerage or whoever you need to in order to trade. Uh, these trading classes or uh, seminars or whatever, they allow you or give you trips to tips to trade better so that in the long run, they pay for themselves. And so the idea here is when you spend money in a business, and this is a general business principle, anytime you spend money in a business, it needs to pay for itself not just get a tax deduction it needs to fully pay for itself now <clears throat> trader tax status allows you to deduct your trading expenses on your tax return and this is important because that increases the cash flow back into the business but there are qualifications for this and now the qualifications actually the start with starting point is irs publication 550. and though for those of you who are serious about this I would suggest going to the IRS website and, and the search engine there, type in publication 550. It's a, it's a big document, but it has everything in there about taxation of investments. And in there are the qualifications for uh, applying track, trader tax status to your tax return. First of all, <clears throat> you have to seek from profit from daily market movements on the prices of securities or commodities and not from dividends, interest, or capital appreciation. In other words, you're, it doesn't have to be day trading, but it does have to be something very uh, short term. So it could be swing trading, it could be something else. Uh, so, <clears throat> but the idea here is that you are profiting from very quick movements in the market. Your activity must be substantial. <clears throat> well, what does that mean? Well, hang on a second. And you must carry on the activity with continuity and regularity. Well, what does that mean? Well, here's the problem we have with IRS regulations. A lot of them are written very vaguely, and I think, I suspect they're written vaguely on purpose. Because the IRS is a bully. Just be up in front with everybody about it. They are. And they can take a vague uh, IRS code and apply it to the taxpayer however they want to. And 90% of the time, maybe 95% of the time, the taxpayer cannot argue with them or cannot fight it in court. And so the IRS gets what it wants most of the time by taking a vague uh, uh, ruling. And so these things are here very vague and <clears throat> have been applied, but a few people have actually taken this stuff to court. And this is where we get a feel for qualifications for using it. Now, these are ones that have been tried and true, proven in court. It is possible that you could get by with lesser qualifications to use trader tax status, but it has not been tried in court. And so if you're willing to do that, it sounds great. But this is, these are the minimums right now. So our court case is summary. First of all, the holding period of what you're investing in <clears throat> has to be less than 31 days. 
So we're talking less than a month here of holding this stuff. So day traders obviously uh, qualify for this. Swing traders would qualify, <clears throat> even if you're doing on a biweekly basis or whatever, uh, something like that. Uh, just less than a month is what period you're holding stuff. Now that does not mean you can't have long-term stuff. It just means the bulk of what you're doing is short-term. Excuse me a second. All right, second one. In Papa versus commissioner, this is the big one and the, really the guy that we use to uh, <clears throat> make get our clients to, to conform to. Trading occurs 75 to 80% of the trading days per year. Generally, we advise our clients, make sure you're trading at least three quarters of the trading days per year. So <clears throat> if there's 200 trading days per year, I don't know exactly how many there are, then you should be trading at least 150 of them. Um, now, also out of that, there needs to be at least 700 trades per year. Some people will tell you 720, but 700 seems to be the, you know, if you get close to that, you're usually pretty good. <clears throat> and 500 hours of trading activity. Now, 500 hours of trading activity could be actual trading. It could be uh, research. It could also be attending education classes. All of that stuff, and that averages out about two, four to six hours a trading day. So uh, the days you're actually trading spend four to six hours. Now, the last qualification we come up with is your intent is to make a living, either solely as a trader or supplementary to other income. So your idea here, the idea here <clears throat> is your trading is supplementing what you've already got going. And so these three qualifications here, really, the idea, they capture the idea of that you want to treat this like a business. And I keep coming back to that, but uh, the, IR, the IRS with their general qualifications kind of imply that. These narrow it down even further. So if you want to do this, if you want to take and deduct expenses on your tax return using trader tax status, uh, then you really need to kind of meet these qualifications here, particularly the bullet point about the 75% of the trading days, 700 trades per year, and 500 hours of trading activity. Well, you can ask, okay, how do we prove that? How do we show this stuff? Well, the best proof of most of this is your 1099B and your monthly statements from your broker. <clears throat> that will show that you're trading 75% of the trading days per year. That'll show how many trades you have a year. A year. It'll show that everything is short term. Uh, now, it will not show the 500 hours of trading activity or your intention. However, what we do recommend is that for to, to prove the 500 hours of trading activity, keep a daily log of your trading. So when you first start in the day, you write down or type it into your computer, wherever you want to keep it, but keep a log of what you're doing and the time it takes to do it. Probably would be good to have actual time measurements like started at 5 a.m. in the morning or whatever and went to such and such time. I realize that's a hassle, but if the IRS ever comes in and audits you, you have proof of all this stuff and then can justify the trader tax status. Now, <clears throat> Let me make a point here. Trader tax status is not something that you have to file with the IRS for. With trader tax status, you just do it on your tax return. So if you're filing an individual tax return, uh, you would deduct your trading expenses on the Schedule C if you meet these qualifications. And so the Schedule C would contain all the expenses you have. Now, it's not going to contain any of the income. Uh, because the income from trading, the capital gains or capital losses, those go on a different form. But the Schedule C does hold the expenses, and you just do it. If you meet the qualifications, you just do it. So all of you right here today could do this on your personal return. <clears throat> now, if you have a separate entity set up for trading, then you could do it there as well. It's not a big deal. I'm just I'm emphasizing the personal aspect for the moment. Okay. So trader tax status allows us to deduct these expenses and thereby get more uh, tax refund, if you will, to get more money back into our business in order to 
actually save money that way, to, to invest that money uh, from the tax savings. Now, are there additional ways to increase cash flow? <clears throat> well, this moves into our second part of our, our presentation here. We're going to talk about forming an entity. Why would you want to form an entity? Well, forming an entity, usually an LLC, uh, allows you to deduct these expenses and allows you to report the trading income. And generally, LLCs, whether they're taxed as a partnership or an S corporation, those are pass through entities and they come right back to your personal return. Well, why would you do that? Well, Let's look at that here in a minute, but you may be thinking, well, LLCs, those involve a fee and <clears throat> all that. Well, while there's a fee for the LLC, which is a decrease in cash flow, the IRS is less likely to scrutinize a legitimately formed business where trader tax status is not as big of an issue. Let me translate that. If you form an LLC, and I'm not, <clears throat> by the way, when I say LLC here, I do not mean a single member LLC. A single member LLC does not do a trader any good. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit. The reason for everything goes back on a Schedule C. Again, it gets reported exactly like uh, it would if you didn't have an LLC, if you're just doing it as a private investor. So a single member LLC does not do you any good. We need something that gets it off your personal tax return. So a multi-member LLC or a, a single member LLC that elects to be taxed as an S corporation. That's where we start getting those uh, benefits. So the fee, you still pay a fee every year to the state that you're in, generally except for Arizona who that doesn't have a yearly fee. Uh, but you'll pay your yearly fee to the, uh, the state and then that's a decrease in cash flow, but it gets rid of the scrutiny of the IRS. And then you don't have to worry about trader tax status, quite frankly, as much there because they kind of ignore you a little bit. And the cost of IRS scrutiny can far exceed the, far exceed the cost of maintaining an LLC. This is kind of like insurance. And this is one of the primary ways of actually were primary reasons for actually setting up an LLC, multi-member LLC, is to avoid the IRS scrutiny. It's like insurance. You buy insurance for a business, you buy insurance for a house, you buy insurance for your car. This is insurance to keep the IRS out of your business, which is a good thing. But there's a couple other reasons here that I don't have them here. But let me give you a couple, I don't have them on the slide, but here's a couple other reasons. Another reason for forming an LLC is asset protection. If you have a possibility of you being sued or uh, some other pro legal problems with either the, the IRS or your state revenue agency or something like that, and you have that problem personally, putting your trading assets into an LLC protects them. Now, you have to do this before any type of problem arises. But if you get your trading assets into an LLC and you get sued personally, let's say you have get into a uh, automobile accident, it's your fault, you get sued, those trading assets are protected. So that's a second reason for setting up an LLC. Here's a third reason. And this is the one that we, I'm gonna talk about this a little bit later. We can find ways to get the state and federal government to pay for the LLC. And I'll talk about that here in a little bit because that's it's really cool how this has happened in the last few days. You guys are the only the second group and you're gonna get the more specific information about it than what I even talked to with another group, but let's go on. So what type of LLC would you want to set up? Well, as I mentioned already, there's two uh, types of LLC. There's a single member LLC, a multiple member LLC. The fee is generally the same depending on the state. So almost every state, again, with the exception of Arizona, requires you to pay a fee every year to keep renewing the LLC. Uh, that fee, uh, with the exception of Arizona, again, is as little as $25. South Carolina, it's 25 bucks, and can be as high as California, which is $800. Now, most states, 
that's generally from about 100 to 150 dollars is the yearly fee not a big deal but it can be a big deal if you if, you, if you're cash strapped but we want to talk about how ways to actually help that uh, take care of that so you got two different types of llc's single member and multiple member fees the same a single member llc which is also a sole proprietorship is generally taxed on a schedule c of the personal return this is why we don't like it we want to get away from that schedule c and i'll talk about that actually in the next <clears throat> in a little bit but the schedule c is rather problematic it can be done not a bit i mean it, people do it all the time but remember i was talking about avoiding that risk with the irs this is the thing that schedule c is what increases your risk of audit with the irs however if you do form a single member llc you can elect how it's going to be taxed that's what's nice about llc's is you could choose how it's going to be taxed so a single member llc can can be taxed as a sole proprietorship on Schedule C. You can also elect with the IRS to have it taxed as an S corporation or a C corporation. Now, a couple of years down the road, let's say you elect it to be taxed as, first of all, let's just go as a sole proprietorship. You're gonna start out a sole proprietorship, and two years from now you say, wait, I wanna be taxed as an S corporation, you can do that. File the election out with the IRS. And then a couple of years later say, I don't want the S corporation anymore. I want to go back. You can do that as well. And you can go back, you can go to a C corporation, you go to an S corporation. And the LLC gives you the flexibility of how you're going to be taxed, which frankly is very important when they're changing tax laws. So uh, we don't know what's going to happen two, three, five years down the road. But if they change the tax laws and you have an LLC, you can actually change how you're going to be taxed. Now, it has to be done at the beginning of the year, but it can be done. All right, a multi-member LLC is generally taxed as a partnership. And, and this is where most of our clients start off. Uh, they're going to be taxed as a partnership. They file a partnership tax return, but they can elect to be taxed as an S corporation or a C corporation. Again, that benefit of using the LLC as a kind of you can change how it's going to be taxed now here is the key <clears throat> to all of this the number one most audited business is a single member llc or a regular schedule c sole proprietorship and it has nothing to do with trading it has to do with the schedule c schedule c's have been abused by people over the decades People have tried to deduct hobby income. They've tried to deduct all kinds of stuff on there. And the IRS just naturally perks up its ears when they start seeing a Schedule C. Now, some of you probably already have Schedule Cs on your tax return. And you say, well, I've never been audited. Consider yourself fortunate. I'm not saying you will be audited, but I am saying it does increase your risk. Now, I mentioned a little bit ago that one of the reasons for forming an LLC, a multi-member LLC, or having an S corporation is to get the IRS's um, vision off of you, to get their scrutiny off of you. And it does dramatically reduce the, 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 that risk, if you will. <clears throat> the second reason for forming an LLC I mentioned was for asset protection. If you think uh, you could be sued, maybe by a renter or something, you've got rental real estate that you own personally, uh, it might be good to get your trading assets off into an LLC if they're protected. But here's the thing I wanted to talk about today, and this is the specific knowledge that uh, I wanted to, to mention to you. We were approached by a, a group um, a few weeks ago, and they were asking, they wanted me to do a presentation, and they were asking about specific reasons for forming an LLC. And so I started crunching some numbers, and I said, when would it be possible or when is it advisable for a person to start an LLC? Well, the two reasons I just mentioned to you um, are, are viable reasons, uh, the uh, asset protection and get rid of the IRS scrutiny. But I've also found a way to get the IRS and the state revenue agencies to pay for it. And you say, what? Well, when you form an LLC, you get to deduct all the expenses you have in trading. Plus, you get an LLC fee 
and you get you have a tax prep date. Uh, there's no ways around that because you're going to have to tax prep a partnership or you're going to have to tax prep an S corporation. So you're saying, wait a minute, those are those those are extra fees. What I've done is calculate that if you can get uh, extra fees, other fees other than the LLC fee and the preparation fee, if you can get between $690 in extra fee, extra expenses to $4,900 in extra expenses, you will pay for the LLC and, and the tax preparation fees by using refund money. In other words, you're getting the IRS and the state revenue uh, agencies to pay for your LLC. Now, the reason for the range, and again, that $690, day, $690 up to $4,900, it depends upon your tax bracket. Now, I figured this at the 24% tax bracket. I would say most of you, if not all of you, are at least in the 24% tax bracket. And if your tax bracket goes higher, then this even gets better. Uh, those numbers go down. So just think about $690 to $4,900. Um, if, <clears throat> if you have a state tax, if you live in a state that has a tax system, you can take, obviously, the federal tax bracket you're in, take the state tax bracket. In other words, that puts you up in a higher tax bracket. That make, bracket, this makes it even better. So this is actually computed. Uh, the way I did it, the assumptions are uh, we used our, L our tax prep fee for a, an LLC, and I used a, the fee for California of 800 bucks a year. And I looked at that from a 24% tax bracket with no state tax and varied some things here and depends upon the state that you're in between $690 and $4,900 in expenses that you deduct those, you will pay for your LLC, which is incredible. Now, <clears throat> if you want specific numbers there, we can, I can certainly run those for you, but not in this webinar, okay? Uh, call the office, maybe set an appointment, and I can run the specific numbers of what you will have to have uh, in extra expenses. Now, extra expenses would be any payments you make for an education class, training class. As I mentioned earlier, a lot of training classes are $5,000. If you got to deduct that, you got your LLC paid for under any circumstance as long as you're in the 24% tax bracket or higher. Um, uh, you got data feeds, you've got uh, maybe some chat rooms, you've got home office deduction. By the way, with the Schedule C, um, for traders, you cannot take the home office deduction. And I realize everybody talks about, yeah, you can. Well, if there's no income on that Schedule C because your income is sitting on Schedule D, then all you show is a loss. And if you have a loss on the Schedule C, you can't take the home office deduction that thing opens up, that home office deduction opens up if you do a multi-member LLC or an S-Corp. And so that can be $1,500 or more right there. So we're talking, we're not talking a lot of money here in deductions. We can come up with it. And once you get past that $4,900 mark under any circumstances, your LLC is paid for by money from the IRS and the state revenue agencies. So that's a very important thing right there. Um, and I want you to understand that. Now, one thing about uh, S corporations and C corporations that I want you to know, S corporations and C corps require the officers to be paid a salary. <clears throat> now, when you pay a salary, you have to pay FICA taxes and you've got to do unemployment taxes. This is in, in deep, it's decreasing your cash flow because these expenses have to go out. So be very careful about that. So um, you say, well, I'm just going to do an S-Corp. I'm going to do a C-Corp. and all that. Well, there's catches there. And so we have to talk to people and, and, and there's all, get around all the catches and things like that so that we actually set things up for you properly. So what does Traders Accounting recommend? Well, Traders Accounting recommends, first of all, it depends on the situation. As I just mentioned, we need to talk to you about it because your situation may be different. 
but usually we recommend forming a multi-member LLC to be taxed as a partnership. Now, if you're married, you've got your second partner right there. We have a, a lot of clients who are married. They've got their spouse, even though the spouse does not do any trading whatsoever, that spouse is the second partner. You say, well, I don't, I'm not married. I don't have a spouse. You can set up maybe a family trust to save up maybe 1% of the income for some, some beneficiary, maybe your children, niece or nephew, somebody, <clears throat> could be anybody. But that, that trust will serve as the second partner and they only own 1% of it while you only, while you own 99%. That's a possibility. We say, I don't want to set up a trust. There's other ways to do it. We could set up, and this gets a little bit more complicated. We set up a single member LLC and a multi-member LLC. The multi-member LLC has the trading assets, but you're one partner and the single member LLC is the other partner and you still own it all. It gets a little more complex and with uh, high fee states like California, that gets to really be owners as far as setting all, you know, that's the fees and that, but it can be done. So it doesn't matter if you're the only person on the face of this earth, we can get it done. Um, but if you have a spouse or you want to set up a trust, we can get that done as well. A multi member LLC. <clears throat> now, why that? Well, first of all, it creates a trading business where expenses can be deducted. Um, that is a very important thing. We want to be able to deduct those in expenses. And I mentioned a little bit ago, if we can get over $4,900 in expenses, besides in additional to the LLC fee and the tax prep fee, the LLC pays for itself. It does. <clears throat> so you'll get the benefits there. You get rid of the IRS scrutiny. You get asset protection and the, the revenue agencies are paying for it. But at any rate, your expenses are being deducted. Second of all, the Schedule C is eliminated from your individual return, reducing your audit risk. So that's a big thing. Some people do not want to be audited. And by the way, getting rid of that Schedule C, it really takes your personal tax return, and the only thing left on your personal tax return might be W-2s, 1099-Rs, and that Schedule K, or that K-1 that's coming out of the partnership, or the S-Corp. Um, those have all been reported to the IRS anyway. So it makes your personal return ironclad. Now, the only thing that would cause a situation, uh, rental property, where, where you're reporting numbers that that's not reported to the IRS, you know, like uh, uh, repairs and maintenance or something like that, <clears throat> that stuff is not reported to the IRS. And so that could, create some questions. But if you don't have the rental property on your, uh, your personal return, everything else has been reported to the IRS, what are they gonna argue with? They already know what it is. They, they can do the return themselves. And so this really does make your, uh, your uh, tax return much, much cleaner and more ironclad. Um, another reason for doing the LLC, the partners still claim their share of income on the personal returns as a share of a quote, legitimate business. And I hate to use that word, but the IRS looks at a Schedule C business as not really legitimate. They look at it as very questionable. Um, but once you set up a LLC, a, a multi-member LLC, like a partnership, it's off your tax return. It files a partnership return, or if you go the S-Corp route, the S-Corp uh, return, they look like legitimate businesses, and the IRS doesn't mind you investing in those, and they leave them alone. It also knocks out another problem. When you try to deduct trading expenses on your personal return as a full-time trader, and you've got a W-2 job, the IRS looks funny at that, saying, well, how can you have a full-time job and be a full-time trader? And they, they do that funny, but once you get a partnership or a S corporation, a separate entity that's off your personal tax return, then the W-2, they don't question this stuff anymore. So it really does take care of a whole lot of problems by setting up an entity. And as I mentioned, the partners can still claim a home office deduction on the personal tax return, uh, but you're doing it because you have a partnership or an S corporation. And that, that increases your cash flow as well. So you get the idea here. We're trying to eliminate risk, but we're also trying to get cash back into the business, the LLC, 
in order to push that money into investment then. So all of this has been to say, okay, we recommend a multi-member LLC first. Now, here's why we recommend it first, because it's very easy to deal with. It's very easy to work with. Uh, if you could put money in, you can take money out, things like that. Uh, it, it, tax free. You only get taxed on the income that happens with uh, your trading. Now, we say start off with a, a multi member LLC because a lot of people say, well, I'd like to set up a retirement. I'd like to do uh, health care and all this other stuff. And that's great. But before we do that, we've got to make sure your income levels are secure. Your trading has to be solid before you start adding things. And you cannot do um, a, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, healthcare, and you cannot do retirement based from a, from a partnership. You have to move to an S corporation in that case. Well, remember I said a little bit ago, S corporations require salaries. So now you've got a salary component, which gets even more technical. So what we tell our clients, start with the partnership. Once you get that trading solid, you've got a good income coming in, then we can elect to go to the S corporate corporation route and start setting all this other stuff up. So it can build on itself, but we've got to start simply and make sure the base is secure. All right, everything up to this point, uh, trader tax status, setting up an LLC, that is for you regardless of what you trade. Uh, if you trade stocks, options, futures, Forex, cryptocurrency, doesn't matter. Uh, this pertains to you. Now I'm going to look at specifically stock and options traders. And this is where we get into the mark to market election. The mark to market election is an accounting method. So basically what we're going to do is we're going to change our accounting method for the business. But what it does, it basic, it's a simpler method. Now, right now, some of you have been trading for a while. You are familiar with wash sales that occur um, on uh, for trading under normal trading rules. I call it cash trading, whatever you want to call it. Um, wash sales happen, and if you lose money in a year, your net your net loss you can only take three thousand a year on your tax return, and the rest has to be carried forward. Well, the mark to market election gets around that. This is an accounting method that bases the taxation on the current value rather than having deferred losses at all. In other words, it takes the value of your account at the beginning of the year, the value at the end of the year. If your account goes up, that's what you pay tax on. It's, it sounds simple. If your account goes down, you lost money, you get to actually write all that off. So this is a very important thing for stock and options traders. If you're day trading, swing trading, any type of trading that's very rapid, the, and you meet the trader tax status qualifications, then this is important for you. And by the way, you do have to meet the trader tax status qualifications on the personal side in order to get this uh, mark to market election. Now, <clears throat> all your gains and losses become ordinary gains and losses on your tax return. They're no longer capital gains and losses from the point you make the mark to mark election. Why is that important? Well, if you have a capital loss, I mentioned a little bit ago, you only get 3,000 in a year and you have to roll the rest forward. So if I have a net $20,000 loss in my account, I lost, after all the gains and losses have been added together, if I lost $20,000 in my account, I could only write, $3,000 off as a capital loss. The remaining $17,000 has to get rolled over to next year. However, under mark to market, if I did the same thing, then those capital losses now become ordinary losses. Well, what's the difference? Ordinary losses can be used against your income. And what that means is I could take all $20,000 off and write it off in a year and write it off against my W-2 income or my 1099 income. Using mark to market this last year, I have seen people write over $200,000 in losses off 
They wiped out every bit of their income, had all their tax money coming back, and whatever's left over rolls over to next year. Uh, so it's very beneficial from that standpoint. As I've already mentioned, the $3,000 limit on net capital losses goes away. That increases your cash flow. How does that do it? Well, you've lost the money in your account. That can't, you can't do anything about that. You might as well get a tax refund for all of the loss this year so you can reinvest it and start building your account back up. So you got to get rid of that $3,000 limit. And the trading accounts are no longer subject to wash sale rules, increasing your cash flow. And I'm not going to get into what wash sales are here because that's really a complex thing. But it's basically a deferred loss. And I've watched a lot of people in the last year have wash sales. And even though they lost money in their account under traditional uh, accounting methods, with the wash sales, those are deferred losses. The losses got deferred to next year. They ended up paying taxes in 2021 because of those lost sales, even though they lost money in their account. And it's really a sad thing to watch. Mark to market eliminates all of that. Now, I will tell you, mark to market is an election. And this election is best for those trading stocks and options. Cryptocurrency may apply here as well. But there, it's, it, cryptocurrency only applies to uh, the three thousand dollar loss limitation. So that's that's the only benefit you get there. There are no wash sales of cryptocurrency, but it is an election. So the, this election, if you're going to do it, it has to be done between January first and April fifteenth of the year in which you want it to start. In other words, it's too late to get it for twenty twenty two. The earliest you could get it personally would be for 2023, and it has to be elected with the IRS between January 1st and April 15th. Um, and you can read about in publication 550 about how to do that. However, there's one exception. If you start a brand new entity, uh, for example, you start a uh, multi-member LLC this month, you can elect mark to market right away for that entity. Now, you'd have to set up trading accounts for the entity, but you could start right away in the entity with mark to market And here's a strategy that, that we'll talk about. We're about running out of time in this year to actually do this strategy. But if you set up a, a LLC right now, this month, and you get your uh, personal trading account moved over into the LLC account, you can start under mark to market but the personal trading account, as long as you stop trading by December 31st and let that thing sit for 30 days without anything, those wash sales will become regular losses and you will not have a deferred loss into 2023. So that is a very important strategy. We're about out of time where you can do that but it's very important that you stop trading by December 31st and start trading in an LLC by that time period. All right, giving you a lot of information here, but let me give you another disclaimer. The paths recommended here are general recommendations. Uh, they may not fit your particular situation. We've had people call in and I, I consult with people all the time about what works best for them. Now, a lot of times it is a multi-member LLC. A lot of times it's a slam dunk for that. But I've advised C corporations, uh, particularly if you're dealing with foreign uh, entities or foreign members, C corporations may work best. Um, as I mentioned earlier, S corporations work if you want to do uh, uh, pension plans or you want to do health insurance because you have to have a salary there. But we start off, we generally recommend starting off with a multi-member LLC but there is no one size fits all plan. We have to know your circumstances and what's going on and what your, your, your plans are for the future really. And quite frankly, as tax laws change, it would be a good idea to have an LLC because you can change how that LLC is going to be taxed. So if you're planning on doing this, please sit down and talk with us so we can figure out what's going to happen. So let me talk a little bit about traders accounting and then we're gonna to go to questions that you might have. Uh, traders accounting provides entity creation and maintenance. We can set up those LLCs. We can set up the S corporations. 
we can set up the trust, that family trust that I mentioned. And by the way, that's an irrevocable trust. We can do all that in any state in which you are. Let me add one thing. Some of you may be from um, different countries. Uh, this only applies to U.S. tax law, by the way. So don't take this and try to use it in Canada or Mexico. There may be similarities, but you need to get advice there. But we can set up entities in any state in the United States. Uh, we do bookkeeping uh, for trading businesses uh, that our bookkeeper will keep track of a profit or a loss for the business every month. Uh, it doesn't matter whether you have mark to market or not. And then at the end of the year, uh, makes it very clean for putting together the tax return uh, because the bookkeeper has been kept it up all year. And so we can take those numbers and just put them right on the tax return. Of course, we do income tax preparation for all types of returns. I think uh, I've done everything this year. I've done 1040s, we've done, uh, I've done 1065s, 1120s, our partnership returns and self S corporation returns, corporation returns. I've done a pension plan, done trust returns. I mean, we do it all. So we can we can help in any of your tax needs. Um, if you want to do an LLC uh, and have us do the return and then have your personal return done with somebody else, we can do that too. So it's not a big deal. We're not gonna be dictators about it. And then we also do tax and entity consulting. If you wanna sit down and talk to us about uh, your tax needs or your entity needs, we can certainly sit down and talk with you about that. If you wanna find out the exact numbers of how much expenses you would have to have in order to get the LLC to pay for itself. Uh, set up an appointment and I'll be happy to run those numbers for you. Um, but you do have to set up an appointment um, that, uh, first of all, for the tax side, uh, because my, my time is very scheduled because I'm doing a lot of stuff, we'll have webinars, we're doing tax, consulting, tax returns, all that stuff. So very important we get an a, a, a appointment there. The entity consulting is not done with me. I wanna emphasize that uh, generally. Uh, the entity consulting is done with Raven Johnson. Um, she's been doing this for 22 years. She knows what she's doing. Okay? A lot of times you get entities set up. I've seen them set up as quickly in two days. Uh, generally, we're telling people two to four weeks, but sometimes it can happen pretty quickly. So you might wanna to talk to her about getting an entity set up. Now, <clears throat> Let me give you this information a little bit. Again, our phone number is 800-938-9513 if you want to set up an appointment, but there is the free ebook. I would suggest going to this website and downloading that ebook, and certainly uh, you can uh, read through that, get some other information and do that, but uh, uh, certainly avail yourself of that. It, it's, uh, it's a very important thing right now, particularly at the end of 2023, uh, to start looking at uh, how to save money. There's still things that we can actually do and, and, and get this stuff taken care of. All right, let's go ahead and turn to questions here. Um, see if I can expand some of this a little bit. Uh, first question, Debbie asked, or Deb asked, what if the majority of your trades are in an IRA? IRAs are self-contained. They don't have wash sales. You, obviously, there's no tax implications there until you pull the money out. So that is not something you want to put into a, a, an, an LLC. It, it doesn't affect your tax return at the moment unless you happen to pull the money out. Uh, so IRAs, whether it's traditional or Roth, they stay off by themselves. They're still owned by you, um, but they, they just exist by themselves and you trade inside of them and, and do whatever you need to do. Uh, the only issue there with a trading in an IRA, it is potential that if you trade in an IRA, whether Roth or a traditional, and you trade personally, if you're trading the same things, you could develop wash sales between them. Uh, but if you get that personal stuff put off into an LLC, and you still have the IRA on the personal side, then there's no possibility for wash sales at that point. So I'm glad she asked that question. Um, <clears throat> Tina asked, do you recommend a double owned LLC, a person and a company as partners? That is one possibility. Um, you put your, your trading assets into a partnership and you could have yourself as a partner and 
another entity. It could be a trust, it could be another partnership, it could be a single member LLC, it could be a C corporation, it could be an S corporation. Any other entity could be the other partner. And so that works uh, well too. That would get you your extra partner. And then the trading assets still get uh, uh, protected, if you will. It's a good question. Uh, Florida, <clears throat> uh, Tina asked another question. Uh, there is an annual fee. How do you get go around this? You have to pay that annual fee or the state won't recognize your business. But as I said, um, we can, if you've got enough expenses and setting up the LLC will pay for itself. And that's something I could run those numbers specifically for you. But the magic number of $4,900, uh, you get above that within expenses and the LLC pays for itself, even with tax prep fees. So uh, that, that's good. Um, all right, let's see, I'm gonna skip over Doug's because he says this is a little bit complex. Uh, Tina comes back, S Corp with a trust as a partner or C Corp with a trust. Um, <clears throat> I would recommend starting as a, a partnership, an LLC partnership first. And then, because that establishes everything, then you can move to C Corp later on if you want to. The only issue with a multi-member LLC um, and having partners, uh, if you ever want to move to the S Corp, if you ever want to change how you're going to be taxed, then you need to make sure that your partners are all individuals or trusts. Uh, the S Corporation cannot have other entities other than individuals and trusts as partners. So C Corp, C -Corp cannot be uh, a partner or an owner of an S corporation. They, they won't allow it to happen. So if you're thinking about a partnership right now and you are in the future thinking about moving to an S corp, think about who those partners are going to be. They need to be individuals and um, or trusts. Now, if you don't care a, a bit about that and you're gonna stay as a partnership, then you can have anybody as partners. It's not a big deal. Um, see what else we got here. Andrew says, are there problems of one changes states for primary residents after the set up? Yes. What we would recommend, um, here's a problem. If you, and a lot of people ask me, well, where should I set up my LLC? Uh, I live in, let's say, um, California. Can I set it up in Nevada? The answer to that is yes, but, if California finds out that you're doing business in California, you're running your trading business, then they're gonna require you to register as a foreign entity. So now you've gotta register in Nevada and you've gotta register in California. So to kind of the, the question here, you need to be registered in the state from which you're actually going to be running the business. How does that ch challenge people when they're moving? What we suggest is if you move from one state to the other, you close down the LLC in the one state that you're moving from, open it back up with exactly the same name in the next state. What that does, that reforms it in the new state, but by using the exact same name, all your IRS stuff, all the stuff on the federal level stays the same. You don't need a new EIN, you don't need a new name, you just change your address and you're done. So that saves a little bit there. So it does create a bit of a problem moving, but it can be done. Um, uh, Doug says, uh, I currently have a multi-member LLC for a separate business from my wife. Can I use the same LLC for trading and myself? Um, a lot depends upon legal risk. If your, your other business has the possibility of being sued, even a remote possibility, and somebody were to sue, then I would recommend setting up a separate LLC. And the reason for that, you put your trading assets into this business and you get sued, then if they, uh, the person who's suing wins, then they have access to your trading assets now, uh, which is not a good thing. We really don't want that to happen. Think about that with real estate, rental real estate as well. You do not want rental real estate and your trading assets in the same LLC because renters sue all the time and then that opens up your trading assets to everything. Um, Jim asked, uh, can any expenses be written off on personal taxes? 
uh, if you do not meet the basic requirements. Uh, technically, the expenses then, if you don't meet the basic requirements, then they go on a Schedule A, so you have to be uh, have to itemize, and then you have to be very careful about what you write off in that case. So the short answer would be no, you can't just write anything off. You, if you're going to write them off on a Schedule C, you got to meet the trading requirements. A few of those could be written off on a Schedule A if you do not meet uh, the requirements. Uh, Tina comes back. Tina's got a lot of questions. Uh, so you're basically saying that a trader should or is taxed as an S corporation because of the pass through and as a trader. Must I be a pass through corp? Therefore, a C corp is not the route to go as a partner uh, to say a family trust. Yeah, C corps are not pass through entities. Uh, so C corps do they pay their own taxes and there are issues with those. Uh, while they've got some great benefits. Uh, C corps have a lot of problems, and one of those is getting money out of it. About the only way to get money out is there's two ways. One, you pay yourself a salary, which we went through with all payroll taxes uh, that you got, the payroll company stuff like that, or you pay yourself dividends, which you get double taxed. They're taxed on the corporation side at 21%. They're taxed on the individual side. Uh, let's just say you're in the 24% tax bracket, so now you're looking at 45%. Those dividends get taxed. Uh, can be higher than that. Um, so that can be a, a problem. So I, we generally tell our clients, don't use a C-Corp unless there's a, a really good reason for doing it. A family trust works really well. You can save up for uh, some people in your family that you're, you want to. Okay, I'm not seeing any other questions here. So um, going to ask for our moderators to come back in and if they've got any questions or to kind of wrap this up. Um, no, I think that was uh, that was great, Jerry. Everybody give uh, Jerry some uh, uh, a virtual golf clap here. Uh, great intel. Very timely right at the end of the year. I'm going to uh, I'll get with Bryce or the folks on your end, Jerry, and we'll maybe we'll do one of these quarterly because this is just great intel instead of just at the end of the year. So uh, I appreciate yeah. it. Great intel. I wrote a ton of stuff down. Uh, Jerry gave out his phone number uh, and uh, some contact info. Go to tradersaccounting.com slash TGO. And uh, I'll share uh, with Jerry and his team, uh, the folks that registered for the brief, uh, so they have your contact info and they can reach out to you uh, on their own. So, Jerry, uh, thanks for uh, coming to TGO. We appreciate it. Looks like the, uh, the book provision just came out. Uh, so it's off to the races. Anything uh, else, my brother? Uh, no, it's, there was one question that I missed. Uh, Jim said, is there any reason to set up an LLC now if you don't meet the basic requirements? Um, it could be if you want it in place for next year, if you plan on meeting the requirements, or if you want to start getting everything moved over this year and clear out those wash sales that you might have, that would do it. So that would be the reasons for doing it now. That's a good catch. So you got, uh, what, two, two and a half weeks to knock that out. Yeah, you gotta start moving if you're going to do it. Yeah, exactly. Cool. But it, it also sounds like uh, potentially Raven or folks on your team could help uh, knock that out in a couple of days or call it a week or two. You, you have time. So, Absolutely. Uh, yeah, cool. Started right. now. Awesome, Jerry. Uh, thanks. Merry Christmas. God bless. Have uh, happy holidays. Folks, I'll get right. you uh, the uh, recording of this once it renders. I'm going to go jump in the car, watch some uh, my boy play hockey. So I'll get the replay out here shortly. So have a great right. rest of your day. Happy hunting. Uh, make Thank sure you're you all. Yeah, awesome, Cherry. I'll talk to you later, brother. Have a good right, one. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.